It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mm -hmm. Last week, the government of, of Alberta announced that they would be asking a third party to conduct a review of how that province responded to the COVID-19 pandemic. So my question to the Premier is, has he discussed this review with his friend, the Premier of Alberta? And if so, is the Premier willing to consider conducting a similar independent review here in Ontario? Minister of Long-Term Care to reply. And thank you for the question. Apparently, some of our MPs thank you, Speaker, disagree. and thank you for the question. Our government has been clear that we are committed to an independent commission. It will have public hearings, public report, and the transparency involved in this process uh, is our commitment. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, last week the Premier said the government was prepared for a second wave of COVID, but was unwilling or unable to share any details of that. Uh, families have heard assurances from this government before. Uh, this is the same Premier that insisted that there was an iron ring around long-term care while COVID-19 was spreading through long-term care homes and killing over 1,800 seniors. An independent preparedness review could look at what worked and what didn't and ensure that we are actually prepared for a second wave. Will the Premier launch such a pro process today? Again, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, since the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak, our government has taken progressive and prudent measures to protect the health and well-being of Ontarians, including our residents in long-term care. Uh, we are carefully and gradually reopening the province and the people of Ontario will remain at the centre of those decisions. And those decisions are being advised upon by worldwide experts. Our Chief Medical Officer of Health, the experts in science and evidence on COVID-19. We are moving forward to make Response. sure that all our residents in long-term care and Ontarians have the utmost of our commitment to their safety and well-being. And the final supplementary. My final supplementary is to the Premier Speaker. As the Premier knows, there's a lot at stake if a second wave of COVID-19 hits our communities. Our ability to work, the health of our kids in schools, the safety of our seniors in long-term care are all at risk if we aren't fully prepared for a second wave of COVID-19. The Premier is once again insisting that he's fully prepared. Uh, that wasn't true last time, Speaker, and it's no wonder that people don't believe it's true this time either. So why is this Premier afraid of having an independent review of what he's done so far and what he needs to do better? Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again for the interest in this matter. We have been clear and transparent about having an independent commission that will get to the bottom of the issues in long-term care. It was clear, even with the Justice Scalise report back in the summer of 2019, that our system was strained under COVID-19, which affected the, the global uh, long-term care homes and our most vulnerable people worldwide, uh, that our system was strained and we are going to find out what happened. We will be having that commission uh, and, and announcements will be coming. Uh, we are very pleased that, that we are getting to the bottom of this. Ontarians deserve answers to their questions. This will be independent. Response. There will be public hearings and there will be a public report. We will get to the bottom of it and we will fix long-term care. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, with all due respect, uh, Justice Galiz's report apparently was not taken into consideration, and now we have over 1,830 seniors who've lost their lives in long-term care. It's a tragedy that should have been avoided. Uh, but my question is to the Premier, Speaker. He might think that the government has nothing to learn from an independent review, but families across Ontario have real concerns about the province's readiness for a second wave. Last week, the Premier rolled through Essex for a series of photo ops, but mm -hmm. local mayor were pretty frustrated when the Premier didn't take time to hear their concerns about the desperate need for a coordinated response to ongoing outbreaks amongst migrant workers. Unlike other provinces, Ontario has failed to protect these workers and the communities they live in from COVID-19. 
Why is the Premier opposed to an independent review that would point out what he could be doing better in preparation for the second wave? The Premier to reply. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we had a great visit to uh, Essex, and I talked to Mayor Santos and Mayor McDonald, followed up with phone calls, made sure they were in touch with Knight Anderson if they had any, uh, any concerns at, at all. So I thought it turned out uh, extremely well visiting the people out there and seeing firsthand and talking to the farmers in and, and not only the Essex area but up in the Chatham-Kent area as well. And there's nothing better than getting out there and, and meeting the, the people. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm first to admit, do we all have challenges right at the beginning? Yes. But I don't know if you saw the article or the newscast on CNN. You want to crush the curve? Do what Ontario is doing. The rest of the, the rest of the world, the rest of the world, Mr. Speaker, is watching what we're doing, and we have a long ways to go. By no means is this fight over, and are, are we, we aren't even close for this fight to be over. But maybe the rest of the Response. world can pay attention to some of the things that we're doing, uh, working collaboratively with municipalities and with the federal government. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I, I find it really uh, quite. Unbelievable that the Premier thinks that 1,838 lives lost in long-term care is a victory. Yeah. Uh, last May, the Premier claimed that he had actually established a long, uh, an iron ring around long-term care. We know that even as he was saying those words, Speaker, residents were enduring co conditions that were so bad, in some cases, police had to be notified. And over, as I said, 1,800 long-term care residents have died from COVID-19. This matter desperately needs an independent public inquiry. The Premier blocked that and has promised his commission, which is still nowhere to be seen months after it was promised. In the immediate term, though, families really do need to know that their loved ones will be protected. Question. So, will the Premier put in place an independent review before the second wave hits? And the Premier. For, for you, Mr. Speaker, I, I guess the Leader of the Opposition is putting words in my mouth. I never declare victory on this. This is an ongoing battle continuously, and the only people that deserve any kudos are the people of Ontario. Not even the government, not me, but the, the people of Ontario. And that's why we're working so hard, uh, again, with the municipalities, work, uh, working with stakeholders right across this province and working with the federal government. And we're very fortunate because of the, the great work that uh, everyone has done. Now we have uh, additional support over a tune of $7 billion, uh, thanks to the, the federal government. We appreciate their, their support and their financial support as well. It's going to go a long way for, for transit in uh, large urban areas, along with municipalities. All 444 of them are going to benefit Response. Uh, from, from the funding here. So thank you. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, whether it's parents who still don't know when school is going to be resuming for their kids or frontline staff in our hospitals and long-term care, people need to know that Ontario has the equipment and the resources that we need and the right plan in place should a second wave occur. They also want to know where their government went wrong and how they can do better. The Premier's top priority may be staging photo ops with the Conservative Party donors throughout south southwestern Ontario, but there's still much, much more that needs to be done. So my question is pretty basic. Why won't the Premier agree to an independent interim review in preparedness for the second wave, as his friend from Alberta is doing as we speak? Premier. Mr. Speaker, we're reviewing this every single day. I get questioned every single day at 1 o'clock, and they aren't softball questions by any means. Uh, we're, we're going through a review every single day and correcting the issues, because by no means, uh, Mr. Speaker, is anyone perfect when we're dealing with COVID. It's something that uh, the world, uh, you know, it just attacked the world, basically, and we're dealing with it. And I, I think overall, overall, uh, everyone in Ontario has done a, an incredible job in following the protocols and the procedures and, and the guidelines. And that's the only way we're going to get through this, if we continue listening to the health and science that our health table is giving us and the rest of the people are following the proper protocols, social distancing, and so on and so forth. That's how we're going to get through this. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier, but I really don't understand why the Premier is avoiding 
you know, having a hard look and taking some accountability around what happened with COVID-19's first wave so that we're ready for the second wave. I just, I just don't understand. Anyways, my question to the Premier uh, is that uh, last week the government was forced to admit that they're not going to keep their promise of uh, funding or building rather 15,000 new long-term care beds, <coughs> which isn't surprising because in two years they've only built 34 beds, literally 99.99 percent short of their goal. Wow. Premier announced new funding scheme, as we all know, uh, last week to construct homes and install air conditioning, but no new money was announced, Speaker. So my question to the Premier is, will private for-profit homes be accessing the existing pot of money under the new funding scheme at the expense of municipal and not-for-profit homes? Good question. Mr. Long -term care thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you again for the question. It's been clear that over the decades leading up to this date, and the beginning of COVID-19, and it's, it's havoc that it's wreaked all across the globe and in Ontario equally, that there was neglect of the long-term care system. Our announcement, our modernizing funding model, is a start, and we've been absolutely clear about that. The neglect that we are catching up on as a government that's committed to long-term care is unprecedented in Ontario's history. I will repeat, unprecedented. The funding that is being put behind our plan, unprecedented. And this is a jump start. We will create an environment with which long-term care can be built. It was not built. Under the previous government, allocations were made. They didn't go forward. They never got built. This government is putting dollars behind its commitment. It will make it happen. Response? We will rebuild, advance and repair long-term care. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, you know, I've watched the Premier talk real tough about those greedy for profit operators at some of his press conferences that he's so proud of, but it looks like his plan is to put even more public money into private pocket yep. speaker. Months ago, when the Premier first promised a commission, he Order. claimed that all issues would be on the table. Well, if that's the case, why is the Premier already moving ahead with policies that will entrench the role of for-profit companies in the long-term care system and shovel millions of dollars out of health care, out of the health care system and into the pockets of their shareholders, the, the private profits of their shareholders? Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, see that's the difference between ourselves and, and the leader of the opposition. I don't look at nonprofit, profit, and so on and so forth. I look at the individual that's sweating their back off when it's 28 degrees because you guys did absolutely nothing for 15 years. We're going to make sure we get air conditioning in every single room. I don't care if it's profit or non-profit, and the families don't care as long as their elderly, the elderly mother or father or grandparent is being taken care of. That's what they care about. Thank you. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, during this time of uncertainty, many municipalities have stepped up to continue to provide vital services for many of our constituents. And as we continue to work towards economic recovery, all levels of government know we have to keep working together to keep people safe. Speaker, as Willowdalers return to work, they need to make sure that they get there safely. And no one should have to turn down a job because they don't want to risk their health during a crowded commute. We must also continue to help people, enterprises and communities adapt to that new normal we hear so much about. Investments in municipalities and transit systems require a shared level of responsibility between all levels of government, particularly the federal and provincial governments. Speaker, can the Premier please tell us about the negotiations with the federal government regarding additional financial and health supports? Premier. Thank you very much. I want to, want to thank our great member from uh, Willowdale. And last week, the government, uh, in coordination with the Premier, has reached a historic agreement uh, for all people of Canada, right across the, the board. And it was $19 billion, and it was a tough negotiation. And again, I give all the, the credit to the, the premiers. I want to give a shout out to Scott Moe. He did an incredible job. And I want to give out a shout out to Deputy uh, Prime Minister Christia Freeland that negotiated hard but fairly. And it's going to be beneficial for every person in Canada, every single province. We're covering everything from testing and tracing to mental health to health to supplies of PPE, making sure everyone has enough PPE. Right across the board, uh, it, was, it was great. There's eight different categories, uh, Mr. Speaker, 
and I think people of this province and this country, everyone's going to benefit from that. So thank you for the question. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And that, and that new deal, Premier, through you, Speaker, is an incredible, incredible news for, for the people of this province. And it's important that we continue uh, to work towards better outcomes here for the people of Ontario, because this new agreement will mean additional support for all 444 municipalities throughout our great province, uh, help for their transit systems. Uh, it'll mean that we can strengthen our health and long-term care systems, Speaker. It'll mean that we can provide a uh, more efficient, effective system for expanding COVID-19 testing, contact tracing, and stockpiling our PPE. It'll mean new funds to help get our economy going again, Mr. Speaker. Premier, your leadership has made Ontario stronger, which means Canada just got better. And this, Speaker, is progress that we can all be proud of. Speaker, through you, can the Premier please share with my constituents and all Ontarians about the significance of this agreement? Premier? Well, through, again, thank, thank uh, the member from Willowdale. Through the action plan uh, for restarting the economy, $3.3 billion in additional health care investments, including $2.1 billion in new initiatives to respond to COVID-19 outbreaks. And the province is increasing the capacity in Ontario's hospitals uh, to a tune of $935 million in the hospital sector, comprising a $594 million to acceler accelerate the progress of addressing hospital capacity issues, and $341 million for additional acute care, critical care beds, and more assessment centres. This is about, again, working together with municipalities. I want to give a shout out to all 444 municipalities that, that helped us, and we all stuck together. The provinces stuck together, and again, the federal government stepped up. Again, I want to thank the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, for supporting the entire country. This is great for everyone. Thank you. Member for Kingston, the Islands. Uh, thank you, Speaker. All the way back in April, uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities released their report with the estimates that municipalities were going to be facing enormous budget shortfalls, uh, anywhere between 10 and 15 billion. And while I'm glad to hear about the agreement with the federal government where they're feeding federal money through the provinces, we have had no clarity on the details of where that money is going to go. And leadership is not fighting against some of that money being used for paid sick days for workers who are going to have to stay home. That is not leadership from this uh, Premier. So since the days that downloading began on municipalities, their budgets have been incredibly tight. They have struggled to maintain uh, in property tax increases in line with inflation, and this government has yet to provide details of what funding they're providing to these municipalities that are facing these tremendous shortfalls. Will the Premier tell us today what that money is being spent on and if the province is going to add increased funding to that money for municipalities across Ontario? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. Um, through you to the member opposite, uh, I think when uh, the Premier answered uh, this question earlier today, he sold himself short. And as I, I have said, and uh, Minister Phillips and, and many others have said, at that table with the other premiers uh, and the prime minister and the, dep and the deputy prime minister, there was one person that led the way in terms of not just speaking on behalf of Ontario municipalities, but speaking uh, on behalf of all Canadian municipalities, wanting a fair share. And that's our own premier. premier Our government continues to work with our municipal partners, with AMO. Uh, as the member opposite notes, we very early on, uh, the Premier and I and our government supported the Canadian uh, Federation of Municipalities' ask of the federal government. We all knew that given uh, the scale and the magnitude uh, of the hole that uh, our municipal partners were in, that we needed a federal contribution. Uh, and again, I, I want to commend the Premier. Uh, for this tremendous $19 billion COVID-19 recovery package that includes clearly the dollars that our municipal partners have been asking for. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I, I didn't actually hear an answer to whether the province was going to add any additional funding or they were going to just entirely lean on the Fed, Speaker, for that money. Uh, 
the budget shortfalls are tremendous, and the amount of money that the feds are giving us are, is not going to be enough to balance those budgets. It's just not. They're not allowed to run deficits. So we are faced with either dramatic service cuts or the province stepping up and supplementing the federal package with actual dollars that go to actual programs. So because of the lack of an answer that I was given just now, I will ask again, will the province be adding Will the province be adding to the federal package? Will they provide the funding that municipalities need simply to get through this year? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, reply again. Well, well again, Speaker, I think it's very important to note that, uh, that the $19 billion COVID-19 deal with all of our provinces and territories uh, really was that significant because of our Premier's work. We acted immediately. Speaker, right at the very start, to work closely with our municipal partners. We were there for them right from the start. We put a package in place that all parties agreed to Border. to allow councils to operate uh, in the early days of the pandemic. Early on, we provided uh, $200 million uh, to help our most vulnerable. I followed that up as part of our uh, commitment to the Safe Restart package with an additional $150 million, even prior. Uh, to this deal being arranged. So, you know, it, with all due respect, we've been there, we've put uh, money up, we'll continue to work with our partners, and we're going to make sure that, and I've said this in the House many times, Speaker, that municipalities are going to lead Response. recovery, not just in Ontario, but right across Canada. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Minister of Education. We are in the middle of the summer, which means that back to school is around the corner, and this is normally the time when parents start planning for the return to school. Parents in my writing are worried. Anyone who is a parent understands the need to prepare their children. We need to prepare them mentally, and we need to make logistic arrangements for return to school. But they don't know what to prepare for, and this is creating an additional stress to the already unstable situation. Education is the anchor of our society, and we need some confidence that we are moving forward with a concrete plan that can be effectively implemented. When will the minister provide the needed guidance to parents so that they can stop worrying and prepare for full-time return to school? Minister of Education, your Thank you, Speaker. Um, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Indeed, uh, I think we all appreciate that many parents of this province have faced uh, difficulty as a consequence of COVID-19 as well in the context of uh, wanting certainty about the way forward. And what we can confirm to parents, to students, and of course our education staff of the province is that we will be prepared to respond to the local challenges uh, and the transmission risks that may arise as a consequence of COVID-19. We will be ready for three scenarios, and boards will have those due to the province by the 4th of August to provide that certainty to families across the province. But our commitment, our solemn responsibility to the people of this province is to do whatever it takes to keep families safe. That is precisely what we will do with more funding, more training to keep all students and all staff safe in the province of Ontario. Speaker. And a supplementary question. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Again, to the Minister of Education. School boards are being asked to prepare for three different scenarios. Unfortunately, they were not consulted on the feasibility of these scenarios. And we are seeing all sorts of pro different propositions from different school boards that raise concerns, such as a plan to remove French lessons from the school year. School boards and school staff are waiting impatiently for a decision from the minister to ensure that all students can receive quality education. They need the minister to let them know how he will ensure that all students will have an equal opportunity to learn this fall. The minister is running out of time. We only have a few weeks left to get ready. Will the minister provide the necessary resources to school boards to bring every student back to school with an equal opportunity to learn for each of them? 
Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, indeed, uh, we are ensuring that the funding and resources are in place to our school board so far, Speaker, in the context of the member opposite. In Ottawa Carleton, their funding is up $25 million. In the areas of Ottawa Catholic, their funding is up just shy of $25 million. Speaker, these are incremental enhancements to students and to those school boards. But we recognize, Speaker, that there's more to do. And we are working closely with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, with the command table, with our boards and our union partners to ensure that all of our students, all of our staff remain safe. It is our commitment. And by having three plans, we can, with confidence, respond to any challenge that arises this fall. Well said. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Avec le réouverture et le with the reopening and the economic restart, funding in infrastructure has never been so important. This investment has always been an, a priority for our government, and it is uh, still the case despite all the uncertainty. Investing in highway project speaker, but we're looking to streamline their construction. Can the minister share more about the work she is doing to build and repair Ontario's highway networks? Very nice. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Eglinton Lawrence for the question. As a Minister of Transport, to ensure the security on our roads is uh, uh, my priority. Now that we know the consequences of COVID-19, we know that we have to improve our infrastructure and create millions of jobs by doing so. That's why we're investing $2.6 million in extending the highway network. Expand and repair Ontario's roads, highways and bridges. And last week, we launched an online tool that provides all Ontarians and businesses with information about highway projects that are planned or underway in, for construction. And so, Speaker, I encourage all Ontarians to use the new Highways program, It's on, the online tool. It's searchable and interactive. It has a map for all Ontarians to see, to learn more about the important projects that we're undertaking in their communities right across the province. And the supplementary question. Thank you, and thank you to the Minister for her response. Ontario's highway network is the backbone of our province. Highways are critical links connecting people to cities and towns across the province, and it's so important that they may remain both reliable and safe. Getting down to work on planning and construction will not only achieve this goal, but will also help create thousands of good Ontario jobs. And that's because highway construction is such an important part of Ontario's economic engine. Can the minister tell us about the work underway on the highways file? Minister of Transportation. So, member for the question, it's time to get our economy back on track and our province get people in Ontario back to work. Transportation-related construction drives economic activity. It puts people to work. It increases money spent in nearby communities, and it provides Ontario with infrastructure that keeps people and goods moving. Last week, we announced our government's commitment to fund Highway 7 between Kitchener and Guelph. This project will include 18 kilometres of a four-lane freeway and a brand new crossing over the Grand River. We also announced our government's commitment to move forward with the expansion and the improvement of Highway 6 and 401 from Hamilton to Highway 401 which will cut congestion in Morriston and improve traffic flow between Hamilton and Guelph. Speaker, these are just two examples of the projects that will improve our network and get people moving and kickstart our economy. Thank you very, very much. The next question, the member for Kiwetanon. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. During the pandemic, uh, children and youth in care have needed more protection than ever before. Yet the government has made, uh, made it more dangerous for them by loosening the safety rules meant to keep them safe. Ontario uh, has also uh, been stalling on providing the number of deaths of children and youth in care during this pandemic to the public. Will the minister do the right thing and share, the, and share with the public how many children and youth have died while, while in care during this pandemic. 
The Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for your thank question. You. I am aware of the recent article published by the Aboriginal People's Television Network and the concerns that it raises. The death of any child in youth and care is a tragedy, and we take our commitment to public sector transparency and accountability very seriously. The length of time and fee for the disclosure of a Freedom of Information request may vary based upon the work needed to collect those records. As Minister, it would be inappropriate to interfere with the ongoing process. But I can say what we are doing to improve the child welfare system. Our vision for Ontario is where every child and youth has the supports and services they need to succeed and to thrive. And we are committed to making this goal a reality. Redesigning the current child welfare system won't happen overnight, but we are committed to a long-term work that is needed to achieve success and promote positive outcomes for children, youth and families in this province. We will have more to come in the following weeks. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I think the least you could do is, uh, you know, through you, uh, is uh, at least waive the fee. Exactly. The government has refused to complete the Freedom of Information Act that requests to disclose the number of children that have died and been seriously injured in the child welfare system since COVID-19 began in, uh, in, in March. This information should be readily available to the public, Mr. Speaker. The fact that the government makes it so difficult to access these numbers doesn't create any trust. Why does, the, why does uh, Ontario not want us to know how our children, child welfare system not protected children and youth during this pandemic? Mm. The Associate Minister to reply once again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for your question. Our top priority remains the health and safety of well-being of children, youth, and families in Ontario, including those who are supported in the child welfare system. Throughout the COVID-19 outbreak, Children's Aid Services continue to operate and provide services to children, youth, and families. Societies have been encouraged to find alternative methods for providing services while observing public health recommendations and using technology where appropriate. As part of this government's commitment and efforts to stop the spread of COVID-19, we have invested up to $40 million to support organizations that provide residential services, including residential services and settings for children and youth. Our government is further committed to better protecting vulnerable populations by delivering a new COVID-19 action plan for vulnerable people. This action plan focuses on three specific areas, enhanced screening and reduced exposure to prevent the spread, infection control, such as managing outbreaks and limiting spread, and sustaining staffing and managing Response. staff shortages. As the situation with COVID-19 evolves, we will continue to communicate with Children's Aid Services and partners and understand the challenges that they may be facing. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. A few months ago, the Ontario Superior Court overturned the Minister's decision to cancel the Nation Rise wind farm. It ruled that the Minister's decision did not meet the requirements of transparency, justification and intelligibility. Now the government wants to hand the Minister even more power to pick and choose which projects get a full environmental assessment. Fired Environment Commissioner Diane Sachs said the changes in Bill 197 would create an enormous risk of corruption and undue influence. Speaker, can the minister explain why he should be trusted with even more scientific power, given that Order. the minister has already been caught by the courts ignoring scientific evidence? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question opposite. And I do know the member opposite uh, sat through a technical briefing, and uh, what he's asking doesn't correlate with what uh, uh, he has learned at that session. Uh, we are modernizing the Environmental Assessment Act, which hasn't been modernized in over 50 years, Mr. Speaker. That's when Pierre Elliott Trudeau was still the Prime Minister, and uh, some of the caucus here weren't even born yet, Mr. Speaker. So what we're doing, 
if this legislation is passed, we'll begin consultation to create a list of projects which will need environmental assessment, much like Canada has already done and majority of other provinces, Mr. Speaker. And that's what we're going to do going forward. Once that regulation is, is ready to go after consultation with community members, municipalities, other stakeholders, Indigenous communities, once that comes to Cabinet, like every other regulation that's made in this province, Cabinet approves it. There's not going to be one-off decisions made at the Cabinet table. That is utterly and completely not true, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. To, speaker, I find it interesting that the Minister's defence of Bill 197 is modernization of the environmental assessment. I guess that means hollowing it out and getting rid of the transparency around it. The government could, if it wanted to modernize Order. the EA process, it could make all large private sector projects subject to an environmental assessment. The Auditor General pointed this out when analyzing the huge financial risk of such projects to taxpayers. Her 2016 report showed that there are over 5,000 abandoned mines in Ontario with a cleanup cost pegged at $3.1 billion. So, Speaker, will the minister modernize the Environmental Assessment Act to protect taxpayers by making large-scale private sector projects subject to an automatic environmental assessment before being approved? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks, thanks again for that question, member opposite, Mr. Speaker. And uh, through the modernization of this uh, Environmental Assessment Act, and, and if this legislation is passed, what changes immediately is uh, we'll be exempting environmental assessments for land claim settlements and other projects with Indigenous communities, projects in provincial parks and conservation areas. And for the first time in the history of the province, we're going to give municipalities a say in whether or not they want a landfill sited in their, their municipality or not. What will also happen, Mr. Speaker, if this legislation is passed, it will enable the government to start consultations on the project list that the member opposite has mentioned. And that is going to have a detailed consultation throughout the entire province. We'll take our time and make sure we get it right so that we align ourselves with the federal government and other provinces. And I, I implore the member opposite during that consultation time to be part of that, bring forth those ideas so we can have uh, our, our hear what he has to say, reason behind that as we create that list, much like I worked with you over the permission to take water uh, with uh, his own area, with, with the, the Guelph region and, and your own, Mr. Speaker. Um, we're a government that wants to work with you. We're going to have that consultation process. We'll discuss what you want to add to that as we're going to talk to all Ontarians. What would they like on that project list, whether it's going to be uh, what the Indigenous communities Response. want, what stakeholders want, what municipalities want. We're going to have a clear and concise list brought forward which will be uh, approved through the cabinet and put in force just like the rest of the country. Thank you. The next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Minister, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Here in Ontario, we have a world-renowned resource-based tourism industry and often have people lined up from all around the world to tune in to an experience of the great outdoors in the northern parts of our province. Hunters and anglers spend more than $560 million and $1.6 billion, respectively, each year in Ontario, supporting jobs and many in our rural and northern communities like Barrie and Innisfil. COVID-19 has hit the resource-based tourism industry especially hard. Could the minister please share what our government is doing to help outfit and tourism operators through this difficult period? Great minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and I'd like to uh, thank the uh, great member for Bar from Barry Innisfil for that question. You know, our, our government is committed to supporting the re resource-based tourism sector, one that was hit particularly hard uh, by COVID-19, where most of their clientele, particularly in Northern Ontario, comes from outside of Canada, and with border closures, it was dried up completely. So we immediately have reappointed a ministry advisory committee, which helped us in advising us what we could do to help this sector. I had conversations with my colleagues from Northern Ontario, including uh, members of the opposition, and we have done something that the Northern, uh, the uh, Nature and Outdoor Tourism Ontario is very thankful for. We have come forward with, we are not charging them for certain fees and licenses, as well as refunding Order. anyone that has already been paid for 2020. This will help to support those local businesses that mean so much. As my colleague has said, $560 million and $1.6 billion, respectively, in this province. Resource-based tourism is something that particularly hard hit. Our government recognizes it, and we're doing what we can to help. 
in the supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Minister, for your actions to bait more people into the great outdoors. After 15 years of neglect under the Liberals, we are fortunate to have a government and a minister that understands and cares about the issues facing the North and rural Ontario. The resource-based tourism industry involves the use and enjoyment of all environmental natural resources on Crown lands and waters, including hunting, fishing, visiting provincial parks and conservation reserves, camping, canoeing, hiking, snowmobiling and wildlife viewing. Of the over 600 operators in the province, many are small and medium-sized family-owned businesses. These businesses provide stable, local jobs that sustain communities over generations. Now that everyone is perched up and listening, could the minister please share what initiatives our government has undertaken to support fishing, hunting, and the resource-based tourism industry? Again, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you again, Speaker, and thanks again to the member. And as she's pointed out, these are small businesses that when, they're, when they lose 80 percent of their revenue, it's a big blow. We recognize that. I had a great conversation with Laurie Marcel, the executive director of NOTO, last week, and they are over the moon that our government, allowed be, by consulting with people that are in the business, boots on the ground, and also members of the opposition as well, we recognize that this is a big deal for this sector. So waiving the fees and refunding those fees that have already been paid is important. We also last year appointed the Big Game Advisory Committee, which has also brought forth new regulations and new numbers and surveys for hunting, which is going to help to Order. ensure that this business that is a uh, cultural right for people across the province of Ontario will be around for generations to come. And I want to say to the people out there too, remember, we're not having the Americans come Response. up this year because of border closures. If you have a, a plan to do some travel in Ontario, get out to one of those Northern Ontario tourism outfitters, support our people in Ontario. They could use the business, they're backbones of our economy. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, questions for the Premier. Uh, Speaker, Meredith is an elementary school teacher and a solo parent from Riding of Sudbury. And what she heard from this government about a return to school this fall ignores the fundamental needs of children and ignores the pressures on working parents, Speaker. Many of Meredith's students are not equipped to continue distance learning, and their parents will be unable to return to work if there's a full, safe reopening of school. In many cases, women are being forced to step out of the workforce or they're being forced to reduce their hours in order to care for their children. Speaker, Meredith wants to know why the government continues to leave education workers and parents in the dark. Minister of Education. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government announced when it comes to expanding child care capacity for parents that we'll be doing so by moving to a cohort of from 10 to 15, providing upwards of 91 percent of pre-COVID capacity available to working moms and dads in the province that we know need to have that assurance, need to have that commitment by government that their child could be cared for safely. We have done so in this province with great success. We're grateful to the ECs and our operators for adhering to the very strict health and safety protocols we put in place. Speaker, in the members' riding, for example, in the Catholic District School Board, they're receiving an additional $3 million to ensure that that community is better prepared to respond to the challenges of COVID. We're ensuring that they have three plans in place, more funding for technology. Every high school in the province and the members riding will have access to internet. We're doing that, Speaker, to get ahead, to make sure that we're prepared and to keep all students safe in Ontario. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier, back to the Education Minister. Parents and education workers across this province are calling on the government to finally recognize that we need a comprehensive plan that considers the needs of communities, families, and workers. Meredith told me, and I'm quoting her, for many young kids, school is a safe place, and I worry every day about some of my students that have been home for so long. The stress of their needs, compounded by the stress of their parents, is making some of their little lives very volatile. Speaker Meredith deserves answers. She wants to know why the government is taking a wait-and-see approach while parents, education workers, and students continue to suffer. Mr. Education. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the member opposite. Obviously, uh, Meredith uh, has noted a variety of concerns which are shared, particularly in the context of the children being out of school for such a prolonged period of almost half a year by the time September 
uh, roles around speaker, and it's why when it comes to the mental health and the wellness of our children, we're putting in place an additional $10 million in net investment in mental health to hire more psychologists and psychotherapists in the province, reduce wait times and improve care for those very kids. It's why, Speaker, we put in place more access for technology to make sure that we can universalize access to the online learning should that be required in those communities. Speaker, we recognize the difficulty, particularly in remote parts of our province. That's why we're putting more funding in place in remote northern boards in this province to give them every tool and resource to succeed in September. Thank you. The next question, the member from Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. We all know the neglect the long-term care system endured for decades, and we all saw the effects this had both before and during the pandemic. We saw wait lists grow for years and years before the pandemic, and during the pandemic, we've seen the spread of COVID-19 amplified in old rooms with in old homes with ward rooms. So the need for new beds and the renovation of old beds is critical, and that critical need is being underscored today. The minister has frequently spoken in this House about the ongoing work since before the COVID-19 pandemic that has gone into repairing and rebuilding the cracks in the system. So last week, the minister did make a very important announcement regarding a modernized funding model for long-term care development in Ontario. And I'm wondering if the minister could speak to this House and tell the House what the modern funding model will do to help fix our long-term care system. Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member uh, from Niagara West for his good work with his constituents and for um, his concern about long-term care. The modernized funding model is a new approach that will break down barriers to building much-needed long-term care spaces and accelerate the creation of new and redeveloped beds. Over the next five years, the government is investing $1.75 billion in long-term care homes. And by recognizing the differences between regions in our province, creating four new regional categories and tailoring an increased construction fund, fund subsidy to each of these categories, we are enabling the government to address the barriers and needs of different communities. We are providing development grants between 10 per cent and 17 per cent for upfront costs like development charges, land costs and other construction expenses. And we are helping small operators in rural communi uh, communities navigate the high cost of development while ensuring larger urban centres can secure the loans and real estate that they need. And together, all of this will get shovels in the ground faster and get residents into their new homes more quickly. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for explaining the modern funding model. I know shovels in the ground faster is music to the ears of people across this province. You're right when you speak, also, she's right also when she speaks about and acknowledges the differences between regions and communities and that each faces unique challenges in development. I know in Niagara, the region I'm proud to represent in this House, we have communities that range from rural to urban and mid size. Each of these communities requires slightly different approaches, and I'm glad that the Minister has put flexibility into this policy. I'm also glad that flexibility is being accompanied by new funding dollars and new supports for the development of long-term care homes. So my question to the minister um, in, in looking at the Niagara region is if she'll tell this house what this new funding mechanism will do for the Niagara region. Mr. Long-term care. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks again to the member for the question. In St. Catharines, there are three projects in various stages of this development model with 109 new beds and 464 being redeveloped. In Welland, there are two projects with 130 new beds and 62 redeveloped beds. In Niagara Falls and Virgil, there are two projects with 81 new beds and 340 redeveloped beds. These are in various stages of development, with two projects already under construction and with all of them expected to be complete by the spring of 2025. Like Niagara, regions across the province need more capacity and shorter wait lists. Older beds need to be upgraded to modern design standards. We have all seen the harm done during the COVID-19 pandemic associated with ward rooms, which need to be replaced. The modernized funding model represents a significant step toward repairing, rebuilding, and advancing long-term care in Ontario. There are more steps to be taken, and they will be taken soon. Thank you. Member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario drivers have been taken for a ride during this pandemic. 
During the lockdown, accidents were down by over 70 per cent throughout Ontario, meaning insurers have been paying out less claims and pocketing even more money. But instead of taking a strong approach to protect Ontario drivers, this government's opt-in rebate plan has left Ontario drivers haggling with their insurance companies with predictable results. InsuranceHotline.com reports that only 30 per cent of drivers have received some relief, and in most cases, it was next to nothing. For instance, Jim Kenzie wrote in the Toronto Star this weekend that he only received a discount of $7 a month during the pandemic. And by the way, forcing drivers to park their cars and switch their policy to comprehensive coverage is not relief. Whether you drove or not, the, the risk of accident was way down. Will this government do the right thing and make these companies give an immediate three-month 50% rebate on all premiums retroactive to the start of the lockdown? Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, I, I appreciate the question, and frankly, the opposition has been uh, been AWOL on this issue. They talked about it at the outset, Mr. Speaker, but but then this government took action. Here, Mr. Here. Speaker, the insurance industry talked about $600 million of savings across Canada. Because of the actions, the specific actions that this government has taken, the, uh, the independent board, FISRA, which reports on, on and oversees the insurance industry, reported that $650 million of savings had been put forward to Ontario drivers alone, Mr. Speaker. But, Mr. Speaker, that wasn't enough. Mr. Speaker, we asked the industry, and they said that there were regulations that were impeding them being able to give rebates. So, Mr. Speaker, this government acted on that. And, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to act so that drivers get a fair deal from their insurers. We agree there's been less driving and less accidents. That's why we've taken real action and got real savings for Ontario drivers. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The proof is in the premiums, and we've seen this minister and we've seen the Premier being frustrated out of their minds in press conferences. Now he's doing PR for the insurance companies. Even worse, even worse, Premier, I'm hearing from many drivers that they are getting massive rate increases when they are renewing their policies now. Barry from Oakville reached out to my office and said that his premiums are set to go up by 28 per cent, and he's not alone. Of course, nobody knows what's going on because this government has taken the unprecedented step of hiding this year's auto insurance quarterly rate approvals. If, in fact, the rates have gone up, it will have been the 10th straight auto insurance rate hike in a row. So, Minister, has your government approved yet another increase to auto insurance rates during this pandemic? Because if so, you've been AWOL. Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, of the 14 insurance companies that make up 95% of the insurance industry, Mr. Speaker, 12 of those have now provided rebates as a result of what this, oh. this government has done. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, but, but that is not enough. I agree with the member. More needs to be done. And that's why we are, we are pleased to know that, that FISRA, again, the independent uh, oversight regulator, is going to be, as I've said in the past, producing a transparent report on what insurance companies have done. And, Mr. Speaker, we all look forward to seeing that. We know that we've been seeing less driving, we know we've been seeing less accidents, and we know that Ontarians are under severe pressure in terms of costs for auto insurance. So, Mr. Speaker, we will look forward to that report. Uh, we expect to see it later this month. Um, and then, Mr. Speaker, we will all look to see what insurance companies have been doing, and I'll look forward to making further comments at that. Here, here. The next question, the member for Oakville. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Mr. Speaker, as the province moves into Phase 3, many Ontarians are still adjusting to the new normal. As a community, nothing brings people together more than festivals do. They play a pivotal role in community building, bringing people together from different religious, economic and social backgrounds. We are about halfway through our regular summer festival season. As you know, many festivals across this great province have had to cancel their events due to COVID-19. At the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs, we have heard testimonies from many festivals across Ontario, including TIFF, Pride Toronto and the Shaw Festival. Some of these organizations have had some great innovative ideas on how to bring us together during these unprecedented times. Minister, can you please tell us how Ontario's festival and events are continuing to innovate and bring us together? Thank you. 
Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I'd like to say thank you to the member from Oakville who recently took me on a tour of his community as they entered into phase two. And of course, uh, we still have more exciting news across the province as we begin to uh, slowly and gradually reopen our economy into stage three. In the early days of COVID-19, we recognized that our artists and the festival sector would be hard hit and would take likely the longest to recover. So we invested, along with uh, the music industry, $150,000 into something called Music Together so that um, musicians across the province would be able to perform from the safety of their own home. Uh, I've been still flowing a fund for festivals because we want to make sure that next year they'll come back bigger and better than ever. Uh, so we will be funding a TIFF. Uh, we will be funding the Markham Jazz Festival, the Fergus Scottish Festival speaker, uh, the Hamilton Super Crawl Blues Fest in Ottawa, and a number of other festivals across the great province of Ontario. We're also working with a number of different organizations on drive-through and drive-in experiences, and I'll have more to say about that later today. In addition, we're working with Canadian Live Music and Festival Events of Ontario to see how we can have a safe return to festivals when it is safe to do so. But, Speaker, I make, make no Response. mistake, we still are dealing with a social crisis in the province of Ontario where people are very reticent to get back to their old habits, and therefore it will take some time for us to get back to the festivals that we used to know and love, but we will be there and we remain committed to them. Thank you. And the supplementary question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for your uh, insights there. Minister, we're starting to see some innovative ideas when it comes to drive-in, drive-through experiences here in Ontario. We have seen you recently visit the immersive Vincent van Gogh exhibit and most recently the African Lion Safari. One of the latest examples of an innovative drive-in experience is the Lavaza Drive-In Festival, which is set to launch today through July 31st. This festival will be a celebration of Canada's diversity, featuring an incredible lineup of international films representing countries hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. This event will be hosted at one of Ontario's most prestigious venues, Ontario Place. As a citizen of Ontario, it makes me proud to know our government is investing in this premier entertainment venue. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister elaborate on what government supports into Ontario Place? Minister Obviously, Heritage. we're very excited that tonight, the Lavaza Film Festival, uh, the largest film festival of its kind currently in the, in the country, is taking place starting this evening at our wonderful Ontario Place. Mem many members ac across Ontario will recognize that we have three parts to Ontario Place. We have the, uh, the current board, which is winding up its old, uh, its, its old business. We have the uh, current redevelopment ongoing, which is uh, for proposal for criteria that we're looking at, which is alignment to the government's vision, uh, concept viability, delivery certainty and cost benefit uh, to the province. And finally, we're continuing to program at Ontario Place, and I encourage all Ontarians uh, to check out some of that live programming this summer, whether that is the Toronto Shines Festival, which is run by, uh, by Canada's Walk of Fame, Jeffrey Latimer, and uh, Canada, Canadian Idol uh, Farley Flex. Obviously, tonight, the Cuban, a, a proud a production of uh, Ontario uh, will, by uh, Sergio Novrata, is going to be playing on opening night tonight at Lavazza Film Festival. And we will be ensuring that TIFF goes on this year a little bit bit different than in previous years, but we'll be joining today with Order. Cameron Bailey, as well as Joanna Vincente of the Toronto International Film Order. Festival, as we continue to support that prestigious organization and make sure that they are well positioned after COVID-19 to become the premier Order. film festival internationally. Thank you very much, Speaker. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last week the Premier kicked off his summer election tour, and by Friday he was in my riding of Kitchener Centre. We've seen the Premier use this tour to speak to PC party donors and friends of the Premier's office, but unfortunately for business owners like Danny Fetter, superficial tours of my city won't save his business. <laughs> Danny owns a small fitness studio in Kitchener. His business has been closed for four months. He wrote to my office pleading for help because he lost 100 per cent of his revenue due to the pandemic. He told me, and I quote, my landlord has given me a few options, but all they would do is defer payment, which really does me no good. Danny looked to us for help, but this government continues to ignore the fact that landlords like Danny's are still refusing to apply for the government's broken rent relief program. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the Premier tell Danny why forcing him to take on more debt is all that this government is willing to do for small and medium-sized enterprises like his? Minister of Finance. 
Mr. Speaker, I, I thank the member for, for the question. And small businesses, medium businesses like, uh, like Danny's are, are an important priority for us. That's why, starting with the $17 billion program, which had $7 billion of direct support and $10 billion of, of indirect support, tax deferrals and other matters, working with our federal partners, as the Premier uh, did with the $19 billion uh, that will support communities, support municipalities, uh, we continue to support those, uh, those uh, small businesses. Mr. Speaker, um, most important for these businesses is getting them reopened, and that's why we are so pleased and look forward even to today's further announcement about the reopening of the Ontario economy. We have taken a safe and gradual approach to make sure that we don't see the sorts of challenges that we've seen in other jurisdictions, to make sure that businesses like Danny's can stay open once they're open, and to make sure that they're able to get their feet under them. We've worked with our federal colleagues. In fact, there was the further uh, announcement last week about a further extension of the wage subsidy program, again, something this government has lobbied for steadily. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, um, I believe one of my colleagues may want to speak further to the rent program in the supplementary. <laughs> supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. Danny is a sole proprietor. When he lost 100% of his revenue, he lost 100% of his income. And when he reached out to us for help, he deserved more from this government. Instead, the Premier's only solution was for him to accrue more debt. If we want to stimulate the economy, we can't leave people like Danny behind. SMEs are vital to our economic health. Business after business have presented at the Standing Committee of Finance and Economic Affairs, and they have told this government what they need. They need direct financial supports, grants instead of loans, direct rent subsidies, and we need to have these in place for as long as it takes to get our Main Street businesses back on their feet. So again, to the Premier, when can everyday Ontarians like Danny expect this government to step up with the supports that they need, or do they have to take out a PC party membership before this government will do anything to help them? And the response, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. Our government has been working hand in hand with Ontario's business community from day one. We, uh, Ontario has not seen such a business friendly government in over 20 years. And we know that COVID 19 has had significant impact on small business that make up our strong Ontario economy. These small businesses are essential if our province is going to have the economic recovery that we're working so hard to, to have. And as Minister Phillips said, uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why we paused uh, the commercial evictions, so that landlords uh, who have commercial tenants eligible for the rent assistance program through the Canada Ontario Emergen the Canada Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance Program, uh, so that they can use that. And I'm very, very proud to say, uh, Speaker, through you to the member, that just under 20,000 tenants representing 120,000 employees wow. have already taken Thank you. advantage of this program. Uh, there is much more to do, but we will continue uh, to stand up for small businesses in the province, and the Premier will continue to stand up for them as well. That concludes the time we have available for question period today.